Hello, Noah. Thank you so much for joining She Leads today. I am so excited to have you on the show and just to get to know you better. So thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So Noah, you are the co-founder and chief product officer of Odo Security, which is a cybersecurity startup that specializes in zero trust network access. So first of all, I'm going to have you explain that in like very fifth grader terms, just because I'm not familiar with cybersecurity. But before Odo, you were a software engineer at Google, and you also served in the Israeli army in Unit 8200, which is a very prestigious elite unit in Israeli intelligence. So yeah, let's just get started there. Tell me a little bit about your experience in the army, and then more specifically, give me a sense of Unit 8200 and why it's so prestigious and why so many great people come out of it starting their own ventures like yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I think that the army in Israel is kind of, um, you know, if everyone sees it differently, it really depends on your experience. So as you probably know, uh, army service in Israel is compulsory. Uh, it's uh, two years for girls, three years for guys. Uh, so you don't really have a choice. Uh, but then, uh, of course, you want to make the most out of it. Uh, I have to say that the first uh, six months, I was quite miserable. Mm. It's a very um, rough transition. Uh, I served in a um, two weeks basis, so I was uh, two weeks at uh, serving at my army base, and then went back home for a uh, one uh, weekend, which was really tough for uh, you know an eighteen year old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So at first we were studying so much; it was a really tough and intensive uh, course. It was actually six months of training, uh, which is really unique. Um, I have to say that I think that it's, it may not be worthwhile for the army train us for six months and then have us like one and a half years uh, uh, in there. Yeah. I studied uh, network uh, network researching. So everything that's got to do with uh, protocols, how networks are working down to the actual beats and bytes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was based in uh, Jerusalem, in uh, uh, the base there. And that was such an amazing experience. It's kind of like being in a camp for uh, one and a half years. Yeah. Oh, that's it's crazy. So did you go into the army having that passion for networks, computers, and just cybersecurity in general? Or was it something that you discovered in Unit 8200 and then it almost just blossomed from there? So I really discovered it. I actually didn't have a lot of um, urge for computers. Mm -hmm. I was more in the mathematics part. I studied, studied uh, physics as well. Uh, but I, didn't, I wasn't really exposed to computers. And then in the army, I got really uh, a sense of... Um, how interesting it can be. And I actually uh, taught myself uh, programming during that time and then created a project inside the, um, in, 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 to my uh, unit. Yeah. Uh, so it was quite cool because you have a lot of, um, uh, I would say, uh, free, free, um, free hand to do what, mm. I, I wouldn't say whatever you want, but you know, you're in there. Everyone are, are 18 to 22 year old. Uh, and you can just leverage uh, whatever capability you have to to contribute. Wow. Uh, so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So we'll get back to almost the lessons you learned and how you apply it today. But I'm wondering, so now after you completed your time in the Army, and most Israelis I know travel for a year or so and then come back, go to school. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you went to Tel Aviv University right away and almost just right. got started. So tell me about that thought process. Did you know what you wanted to go into right away? Or how was how did you almost plan your career? <laughs> so that's actually a funny story. Okay. I thought I'm going to be, you know, like like most Israelis, it's exactly like you said, I'm going to be a waitress for uh, for a year, earn some money, and then go to South America for eight months. Right. And then after, you know, like two weeks, I was, I was done with that and registered for school. <laughs> so yeah, it's one thing to imagine it, but the other to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any, uh, I, I knew I wanted to study mathematics okay. uh, and I knew it's, it, I wanted to go to Tel Aviv University. I wasn't sure about the computer science part, actually. At first I, I thought to um, um, combine mathematics with economics maybe, mm -hmm. um, and then it, it was my mom that said something really interesting. <laughs> she said, are you even interested in economics? And I started reading some uh, magazines and making sure that this is something that I like. And it turned out I didn't. <laughs> and so computer science was the next uh, logical uh, way to go. And I'm, I'm so glad I did that. It's, it was such an interesting uh, degree. Yeah, amazing. And then after that, you got a software engineering role at Google. And right. 
then Odo happened. So tell me a little bit about Odo and what dr drove you again back to cybersecurity and just the inspiration behind it and getting started. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what drove me in was my two co-founders. Okay. Um, I have to say, I, I, I never imagine myself as an entrepreneur mm. so I did some you know projects in school and in high school but and also obviously in the army but I never saw myself um, I think I maybe was too scared to to uh, define myself as entrepreneur and uh, if you ask my two co-founders uh, uh, they're they're one of them is my husband actually and the mm. other is uh, his one of his best friends and, and mine as well now mm. Um, so if you ask them, I was, I was about to leave, like, I think it was three or four times at the process because I was just, like you said, I, I graduated, uh, the army and then I started uni and then I went to work. So everything was really, you know, one after the other, I had everything planned and then suddenly leave everything aside and just start out your own project without ever knowing if it's going to work and when yeah. that was really scary for me. And I actually already registered, uh, for my MBA. And at the, the, the last uh, moment, Gilad, our CTO, sat me down and said, no, you're not leaving us. Uh, we're doing this together. And he was just really convincing. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, so you definitely had those doubts early on. And um, I think, so at that point, were you married to your husband at that point or were you guys weren't married then? No, not yet. Okay. No, we were just a boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay. Yeah. Great. So then, so you didn't even, you didn't even see yourself as an entrepreneur. So what, what made you take that leap? And you were just like, okay, cause it's almost like a shift in mindset. And I think Israelis, it's naturally in them in a way where they're willing to take those risks and they almost see a, what's the worst that could happen. But for you personally, what made you be like, okay, you're right. Like what's the worst, what, what's the worst that could happen? I should start this. Yeah. I think it, it was definitely the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the fact that I had uh, this um, uh, situation when I where I had two really amazing co-founders that were uh, both uh, quit their jobs uh, actually before uh, we we got to the project uh, or my husband and I uh, boyfriend then yeah. uh, traveled to uh, six months uh, mm. to uh, New Zealand in Australia cool. and then we came back and we we, we quit quit our job for that so uh, we came back we were uh, without job. Uh, Gilad also just uh, quit his job so it was just an amazing opportunity and yeah. I felt like I was going to really regret uh, not jumping on that uh, uh, opportunity and I think that in some sort of way I, I felt that I could be really good at that I have a lot to contribute that is not being expressed yeah. as a software engineer nice and so I heard in your 20 minute leaders talk that you, it was almost in the founding stages, the other two co-founders, they almost knew their role, whereas you could have gone the business development route or the tech, and you could have been a CTO or whatever. So you're the chief product officer. Tell me about that process for how to navigate where you found your contributions most. Yeah, so it's, it's actually also an interesting story because I think that it's always like that, or, or maybe a lot of the times, uh, especially in... Um, Israeli uh, startups. So you have a very defined two roles that always exist in every Israeli uh, technological based startup. Mm. So you have the CEO and you have the CTO. And everyone are always talking and I, I also think it's true that a, th a three member team is always the best. And then you have the question, what, what's, what happens to the other co-founder? What, what is he going to do? Yeah. Uh, so I, I didn't really know. Uh, from a short research, I just defined myself at first as the you know, COO okay. uh, because that was kind of the natural uh, flow of a startup. You have the CEO, CTO, COO. That just made sense. <laughs> and you know, the idea was to just do whatever or and Gilad are not doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, we just uh, actually, it didn't really matter. You know, you do the same thing. So a CTO is never the same, you know, uh, three different startups and a CEO, everyone has the same, uh, right. a, a different definition to the role, same as what I did. So it was kind of amorphic doing everything. And then um, we, I, we kind of, uh, as we progressed uh, with investments and, uh, you know, kind of got out there, uh, we got a few feedbacks uh, for, uh, no, what do you, what, what do you do with the company? And I couldn't really explain it. Yeah. I was all over the place, uh, some a little bit in the tech, a little bit in customer interviews, yeah. you know, 
after retroactively, I, I realized that this is actually a product role. Mm. But uh, I, I was not sure exactly how to explain it. And, you know, everything is, is about the storytelling. And I couldn't, yeah. couldn't get this question answered right. And then uh, it was actually um, uh, one of the, uh, um, I think it was like an accelerator that we, we went uh, to interview for, uh, that one of the, the women there said to me, oh, so you're basically the product manager. Mm. And then it just, it had a nice ring to it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I think that's what I'm doing. Oh. So, so that's how I roll to this yeah. uh, role, the company. So, okay. I think first, before we get into what it takes to be a great CPO, I want to know, so you're the product manager, CPO. Tell me what Odo is and tell me a little <laughs> bit in a way where someone who really doesn't know cybersecurity in this, this whole industry, tell me a little bit about that from, um, from your, yeah, from their perspective. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Odo is, uh, as you, like, like you said, a zero trust network access platform. So what does it mean except for the, you know, big intimidating buzzword? <laughs> uh, so if, if in the past things were uh, really easy, you would, you know, physically go to your place of work, uh, physically plug in your network cable, uh, uh, turn on the computer and, and access the, re the servers that are, are, were physically located in the same uh, area right. uh, things were easy to secure we had a, a, what we call a perimeter like a wall surrounding that network mm -hmm. with a entrance a firewall serving as a guard okay. uh, deciding who, whoever can get in or, or out and whoever was inside was uh, secure and whatever was outside was not secure it was quite easy so mm -hmm. security was was not as amorphic as today but nowadays you have resources everything you know both in the cloud a hybrid on-premise environments all over the globe you have uh, users connecting from everywhere from different mm -hmm. devices especially now you know with everything that's going on yeah. um and you know comes the question okay let's say that i connect from my personal smartphone to my company email server mm -hmm. does this phone uh count as being a part of the network is it not a part of the network Everything is much more uh, amorphic, yeah. uh, so you can't yeah. really uh, put a, a perimeter around it. And this is where the zero trust network access uh, mm -hmm. approach comes in. So we provide uh, security that, um, you know, on its basis, it's, it's zero trust. Mm -hmm. Trust no one. We don't have inside is, is good, outside is bad anymore. We have everything is bad unless authenticated and authorized. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, the, the idea behind it. And yeah. we have a complex architecture that uh, supports that. Okay, great. No, that's so helpful. <laughs> and I could, I could tell you're a great CPO based on your storytelling and, and ability to explain it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. So in, I did that quite a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it pat down. I love it. Um, so in the early stages, when you did become the like chief product officer, was there a learning curve? Because... I think from just research, it doesn't seem like you had product experience and maybe you didn't necessarily, as a software engineer at Google, you maybe didn't talk to customers as much and really understand the, the, uh, the tech, the other than the technical side. So tell me, was there a learning curve or was it challenging at times? I think that the learning curve was more about uh, the actual, you know, processes and mm. the systems that, uh, and the tools that uh, I'm expected to use. Yeah. Other than that, it was really intuitive up until today. So I'm, I'm not sure that I'm doing it 100% correctly. But you know what? I think that a lot of the times, uh, it's not necessarily the, the best uh, practice to go with what other people uh, have decided this uh, role is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I actually, <laughs> I also, uh, I was asked a few times uh, to also participate in a, a product manager's uh, podcast mm -hmm. or, or uh, interviews. And I always said no because I was uh, kind of insecure that I would not be able to answer, you know, the exact words yeah. and uh, all the method methodologies and how, how uh, everything is uh, going on. So, uh, yeah, I had a learning curve. I, I still do. But I try to focus on actually getting the job done rather yeah. than uh, doing it correctly. Yeah. Uh, so. Nice. And it's almost like every every time you do something, you learn from it. And then that improves the next time you do it. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the whole, hopefully, I'm not building like a bad basis for that. But I, I am. Uh, I'm. I, I'm uh, keeping. Um, you know, in entrepreneurship in, in general, and also in product manager, I'm. I'm always keeping like mentors around, 
So I'll be able to ask them about some things and and learn from them uh, as I go. Yeah, amazing. So going back now, looking back at, at your time in the army, and specifically those first six months where you said it was very challenging, especially the transition. Do you, can you look back now and see, oh, wow, like I learned a lot during that time that now I can apply to Odo, specifically when Odo's going through challenges and something where I have to get through? Yeah, uh, I'm sure I do. Can't really point to anything in specific, but uh, I think that this is exactly like you asked. The, it's not a coincidence that you have so many people going through, uh, you know, like almost 100% of the people uh, drafting into the army and, you know, Israel being the start of nations and so many successful yeah. companies coming out of here. So can't really uh, point at the, the link between those two, except for obviously the, the technology that we learn at a young age. Yeah. But definitely there there is something there. Yeah. Uh, probably, you know, we, we need to mature much faster face complex situations, you know, something around that area. <laughs> Definitely. And I think I think the start the book, The Start of Nation, is such a great book because it really, at least for someone that's not an Israeli, it really takes you into the Israeli culture and really explains a lot of the reasons why Israeli is the start of nation. And so I think that's yeah. great. And a lot of lessons are derived from the army. So I think that's yeah, great. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. So give me a little sense of, so obviously on this show, It's mainly Americans, and I talk about being a female entrepreneur or just being a female leader, especially when there's still a gap in female founders and funders. So I want to know a sense of being an Israeli entrepreneur, a female Israeli entrepreneur, and whether that's even a discussion in Israel in a way or uh, whether there's a challenge in finding funding, but I guess you have two co-founders, so maybe that's even a plus to have that diversity, but just give me a little sense of what it's like to be a female entrepreneur and if it's if you've had people surrounding you this whole time and supporting you or any challenges. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think that, like you said, uh, about the diversity in the, in the team that we have, I think being a female entrepreneur was a plus in yeah. our team. Uh, and uh, I, rightly so. I think that, you know, this, this talk about diversity is probably getting old, but we can really see that in our company. We can see how, you know, different uh, people have different uh, uh, opinions. And uh, um, when I think about uh, most Israeli teams, they they would be uh, three exact uh, duplicates of one another for a founding team. Mm. So uh, probably uh, three guys coming out of the army with a good idea. The three of them are, are equally technological, equally talented, and they're just assigning roles randomly. You'll be the CEO, you'd be the CTO, you'd be the VP R and D, and let's go. Yeah. And this can be, you know, rotating. And it, so yeah. I think that most VCs are used to seeing this um, uh, uh, type of, of uh, team. And at first, I was I was a bit uh, um, uh, un, uh, uncomfortable with that. So yeah. I thought that since we're, we're different than the other teams, uh, that would be a minus, but it was actually a plus. Yeah. And I could see that uh, um, investors were really uh, excited about our team. And generally, so I think that it, it's funny because there were so many amazing women before me paving the path yeah. for me to be able to say what I'm going to say now, which is uh, my biggest struggle is to be seen as an entrepreneur who is also a female and not a female entrepreneur. Definitely. Uh, so um, I have to say that obviously I get, um, you know, if, if they have, uh, you know, in some conferences like panels talking about cybersecurity or something like that, all of them need diversity. I'm happy to, you know, just use whatever uh, um, yeah. uh, um, opportunities there are out there. But, you know, all those, uh, you know, female entrepreneur lists and things like that, uh, I try to avoid simply because I don't want to be seen as, as a female entrepreneur, like I said. Yeah. Just uh, a professional entrepreneur, which happens to be a female. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I totally understand that. And it makes, that's why it's even tricky and like not uncomfortable, but it, I hesitate to ask the question. <laughs> Simply because it shouldn't be like that where you're a female yeah. entrepreneur, right? And it's just, to you even, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It is, it's natural. I think that yeah. that there is no difference between guys and, and girls. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a girl, yeah. <laughs> so that's not a question. So it's okay to ask about that, same as you would ask, 
anyone else, uh, whatever you know, differentiator they are there. Uh, but it just became such a big uh, topic to talk about that I'm trying to exactly. also make it professional. Yes, yeah. no, I, exactly. And I've talked to a lot of my guests actually say where almost when you project this, this idea and where you have in your mind and you project, okay, I'm a female leader, then it's almost like this self-fulfilling prophecy where you come into the room with this almost lack of confidence and, you know, this perception that everyone thinks that you're a female, you don't necessarily belong, but it's really, you need to believe in yourself first and have that confidence and then it will project out. So I think that's, yeah. Yeah. For me, I'm like, I'm I'm female, I'm blonde, I'm, I'm one and a half uh, meters and I have a high (laughs) voice, so I can't really blend in an audience in a cybersecurity conference. (laughs) No, and you shouldn't have, you shouldn't blend, so it's great. So, yeah. So tell me about, so yeah, you're in cybersecurity in that space. There's not, there aren't many females and, and do you think, what do you think needs to change to have that, have that change? That makes sense. Uh, Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, that's, you know, it begins in education. Mm. I think that easily I would also not have gone to that uh, path. Uh, like I said, I, I was debating to learn uh, to study something else. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a matter of time. So times are changing, but it's not changing as fast as we would like it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can see that the curve uh, rising up. It just, we need to wait a few more years for it to get to the point that we want to. Yeah. Uh, but I can say that I have uh, tons of uh, female friends from the army or, or not yeah. that uh, are now uh, um, uh, either entrepreneurs in technology companies or, or you know, uh, engineers yeah. in, uh, in the industry. So, yeah, nice. it feels like times are changing. Yeah, great. And then, so for my understanding, is Odo completely in Israel and your team's in Israel, everyone's in Israel or... Uh, no, we actually have a U.S. presence as well. So our sales team sits in uh, the U.S. So, okay, so I'm interested because obviously Israeli culture differs tremendously from from U.S. culture. And just there, there are differences in, for instance, you could explain the word chutzpah and things like <laughs> that. But I'm wondering, has there, have you had to, like, uh, what's the word, explicitly noted this difference in culture and almost like teach your teaching team that okay when we're talking to you like we're coming we're coming from this culture and like does that you know like is there this bridge that you have to build uh i'm sure i'm sure there is so first of all there is the language gap uh that Mm. people may are may not be aware of but it's it's really tricky you run your entire business in a different language yeah and no matter how you're how much uh how good you are in that language it would never be native for you so you would always fight to fight the right word yeah and if you don't you choose another word and then it would not exactly um you know express what you wanted to yeah so i'm always struggling with that Mm. uh and um yeah i think that for us maybe i think that our team is a little more like calmer i would say so (laughs) it's not as dominant the difference but uh yeah i'm I'm sure that we we have and will uh, you know, tackle this, uh, these different points where yeah. we have to, you know, um, overcome the, the culture uh, gap. Definitely. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's a challenge that a lot of, a lot as remote work is becoming more popular, even obviously mm-hmm. nowadays, I think that's definitely an interesting, interesting topic to consider almost. And yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I'll, in mind. I'll let you know if I uh, <laughs> okay, can get into great. one of those situations. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So, no, I'm going to finish off with two fun questions. Um, so oh, no, 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 Michael did that as well. <laughs> no, they're different than Michael. These are, <laughs> these are easier. These are easier, trust <laughs> okay, me. Okay. So one is just a passion or hobby that you have that's just unrelated to your work. Um, playing the piano. Oh, fun. Okay, great. I love it. So <laughs> see, not hard. And then, okay, the last one, which, by the way, first of all, no, I've loved this, and just thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> sure. But, okay, a fun topic. What is a fun or weird talent that you have that no one else really knows about? And so I'm going to go first. Okay. okay. So here's blueberry. I do blueberry throwing and catching. So I'm going to give you a preview. Okay, so here we go. Okay, let's see how this goes. There we go. Oh, wow. That's impressive. 
Uh, do you have like another blueberry there waiting in case you get that one wrong? Of course. <laughs> okay, so I actually have a picture here. So um, Oh, amazing. M- m- my back is really bendy. Okay. So I just found this picture from when I was younger. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So did you, yeah, so did this you, is just an example. Did you do gymnastics or anything yeah. like that? Okay. Yeah, for like 10 years. Oh my God. That's, I love it. That's a great one. And I also yeah. love the your picture in the back. Do, do, do more of what makes you happy. I think it's a great, great yeah. poster. Yeah, oh, did you get it? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay, well, Noah, just yeah. thank you so much. It's been, it's been so great having you on the show. So many lessons I've learned and I've just loved it. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Carly. Of course. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.